Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here standing in front of you. I know you also have to stand there, but at least I have a lot of space, so it's much better up here. I wanted to entertain you today about crypto bugs, so I have a presentation with a few demos. We hope that most of them will work. And the idea between the talk, the point that I want to drive is that cryptography usually is very difficult to break. Say, if you have to break AES-256, there is a small chance that somebody in the audience could stand up and say, I know how to break AES or triple DES or whatever, but the chance is close to zero. Whereas finding somebody who implements cryptography and makes a programming bug is much, much easier. We all do bugs. I did bugs when I program. It's, it's awful. So if you want to be sure that your cryptographic system is sure, you have to make sure it uses the right crypto, but you also have to make sure there are no bugs in it. And I want to give you a few examples where, by simple reverse analysis, we can find out what went wrong with the cryptography. And there's three examples. Um, MXI Stealth, you might have heard about this one before, and eCapsule Private Safe and Data Becker Private Safe also. Um, yeah, this is not, there's no zero day in all of that. This is old stuff. But um, it's nice examples on showing how this works. So the first example is this uh, MXI Stealth crypto key. Let me find the, the working one. Um, I could show it to you. I don't know if you see, actually. It's a key made of two, of two boards. There's a motherboard and a daughter board. It has a, a finger sensor, so you can swipe your finger on the, on the key to make sure that um, to, to log into the system. So it's completely OS independent. You can use that on your car radio to listen to your music. Or it also has a small uh, Windows program which starts automatically when you click it, plug it in, which can ask for your password. And then um, if you type the correct password, it can let you in the system and open a second partition, a second drive on the, on the USB key where all your data is located, all your secure data. So all I've done so far is plug it in. It's as if I had found it on the floor. Somebody dropped it. I, took it and plugged it in here. I would need a finger or a password to log in. Let me start the debugger now because it takes a long time. And then while I talk, um, it can load all the libraries and stuff. So I'll just have to find this thing here. So you'll have to be a little bit patient because all of those demos, but it's more fun when we see it in reality. So here we go. So um, this is a key which has been certified. It's FIPS certified. So it is 142-3 level 2 certified. It means that any American agency, government agency, can buy this because this is secure enough for the data. It has gone through some testing which shows that it has been well designed and well done. Uh, and the nice thing about this certification is that this is a public certification in some way. They have they published the information that they give to the certifiers, to the auditors, to show why this key is so secure. So we don't even have to analyze it too much. We can just look at the data which is on the internet, and we see our daughter board with the swipe sensor and the user database storage. This is what we are going to look after. And here we have a CPU. We have an AES engine which does all the encryption. We have some memory with flash and, 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 and RAM and so on. And it talks over USB to your PC when you plug it in. If you read the text which goes with that um, documentation, it says that the passwords of the users, so we're not looking at the fingerprint, we're just looking at the passwords now. The passwords are uh, hashed with salt. That's a very good idea. And it's hashed with SHA-256, which is a big hash function. And then it's stored on the EEPROM on the, on the card itself. And if you want to log into the card, you have to ask the processor to verify the password. So it's not something which is done on, on your PC. It's really on the, on the card that this happens. And it does this only every two times a second. So you can get 120 tries per minute. There's no chance you can ever brute force this stick. And you can also program it to stop after 10 tries or so. So you can't, you can't even do it more than a few minutes. So 
we were asked to look at this, at this key and say if this is safe enough for, for one of our customers. And so what we did is we first, well, the first trick we tried, since the, the passwords are stored on the user database storage, which is a serial memory on the daughter board, we took two keys and swapped the daughter boards. And we thought my password will go on the other stick and I'll read the other data. But that was too easy. That didn't work. So we went for some more um, detailed attacks. What we tried to do is read out this memory. We wiped some, some leads on it and then recorded the signals that go out when you start up the key when you plug it in. And here you can see the data that comes out of this, this memory. Um, if I can... On the bottom, it's easier here, you see some user identification, then you see the name, this is the admin, and then you see some strange text. This is probably the hash which is um, salted and hashed with SHA-256. We tried to make sense out of that. We tried a long time, we didn't make sense out of it. We had to give up on this part too. So then we thought, let's have a look at the software which talks with the key. Maybe there's some trick we can play, we can replay a message and say yes or no and, and have it do something that it should not do. So we loaded the software in the debugger, which is what is happening right now, and then we went through all the functions and we saw that there was a library which is supposed to talk with the card and the library uses encryption. So all the data between your PC and your USB stick is encrypted. So with a USB sniffer, there's nothing you can do. So we try to see if you can replay the messages or understand what they did. But again, this was well done. We just saw that after a few exchanges of messages, the key would either open up or not, depending whether the password was correct or not. Then we also saw that they didn't take much care about security in the way they wrote the code because it was still full of symbols and debugging functions. So every time it did something, it called a debugging function and that debugging function checked if it had to write a file or not. And it said no, so it came back. But on the stack, you, you have the message all the time. So it says, now I'm sending something, now I'm receiving. This is very, was very useful and has nothing, should never be in a, in a commercial product like this. So then we almost gave up on the system. We thought this is really well thought and well done. And the last thing we did is we tried to go through the memory of the, of the process and see if we can find something interesting in there. So let me see if it has loaded now in here. If we look at all the memory pages and we do some... So what should we search for? Of course, now I know what it is, so it's, it's easier. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it this way. We could say maybe PW do hashes, password hashes, because this is what you are looking for, right? So how much easier could they make it if you can just grep for password hashes and see what's in the, in the memory? And if you run that, you'll see that in some part of the memory you have some string constants. This is the PW hashes that it will need somewhere else in the memory. And if the demo works well, we'll find it a second time in the memory here. And we're here we see, oops, we have a, a data blob. SSD is this library which reads and writes to the, to the USB key from the user U43, blah, blah, blah. This is one of those user identification we saw on the memory. And then it says the blob has the following information. Password first use false. So that password has been used more than one time. And password hashes with a S. All of that. So password hashes is here, 3C. There's 60 bytes of password hashes. So 60 bytes is 3 times 20. 20 could be 20 bytes is a SHA-1 hash of a password. This is not SHA-256 or whatever. This is SHA-1. And we see the first hash we have here starts with 0957. So let me go back to Linux and do something like we're going to search for dragons. So if there might, might be a first dragon in this demo, we search for, we do some brute forcing. The first try, we say, well, maybe the password was 26 C3 dragons. So we pipe that into SHA-1 sum. And then we see, here we go, 09575E, blah, blah, blah. We have just brute forced the password in two seconds. <laughs> we are just genius, right? Of course, you wouldn't start with this one. It would take much more time. 
but this is very, very, very different from saying every half second you can have one try at a password and after 10 times it will block. I can take this home to my PC, I can run that on multiple machines and try to crack all possible passwords. This was really weird. And